September sky Watching as clouds went by We confessed everything to each other Standing Hey everybody, welcome to Adventure Retired, the like podcast where retired people share what they're doing in their retirement to help inspire you to live your best retired life. We are Kurt and Cindy Liljit, all your hosts. And today we're going to talk to a retiree who does mission work in Africa. Yeah, he took a long trip to Africa. I don't know how many he's taken. We need to find out. But it sounds like he was over there a while and did some amazing work. Yeah, yeah. That's just, that's Africa. Wow. That that takes a calling. It does. You know, because that's not like going over to Europe or anything. It's a different life. Yeah, and it's not like vacation, vacation. Oh, no. It's, you're, you're working. Yeah, he's not on safaris. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Okay, but first, a life lesson from Kurt's best-selling book, Fix the Problem and Other Life Lessons from a Pragmatic Dad. Which one do we have today? This one says, people like to talk, so be a good listener. <laughs> Is that yeah. aimed at me? That being said, we're a <laughs> podcast, but I always said, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. And another one is, you'll never learn anything with your mouth open. And that's true. People like to talk. If you want to you know, be around that person and listen to them talk, listen to them. I I heard one the other day, be more interested than interesting. In other words, people really don't want to hear you talk. They want to hear themselves talk. Right, right. So if you can put up with that, you can make a lot of friends. I think it's just one of those things that we all tend to talk about things that we've done in ourselves. and Yeah, we know ourselves better. Yeah, and sometimes it gets old. It does. And some people don't know when to turn off the switch. Sometimes you just have to look at me, honey, and I know (laughs) to turn off the switch. All right, let's get on with the interview. I will will say I have that problem. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Let's get on to the interview. Well, today we're going to interview Bruce Moylan. And hello, Bruce. Hello. Where are you coming to us from, Bruce? Uh, out of Wyling, a uh, suburb of Dallas, Texas. Oh. Nice and hot down there, huh? It's a warm day. Uh, sun is shining and no rain. Oh, nice. Nice. Boy, I have to tell you, you have the voice of a very smooth radio man. If you, you're just, you have a beautiful talking voice. Well, thank you. Thank you. She didn't say you have the face of a radio <laughs> man. That would, yeah, that, that would not be a compliment. Well, that's the reason people get on radio. They <laughs> that's don't have true. To worry about their face. That's true. But we're talking to Bruce today because in his retirement and at the end of his career, but in his retirement, you've done a lot of um, work in mission work in um, Africa. Africa. But first of all, when you were in the working world, what did you do, and how long have you been retired? Well, I was in healthcare management since uh, 1972, and I retired in uh, February of 2009. Okay. So uh, retirement it means I went into seclusion in 2009, and that's what caused me to get uh, out of retirement. Okay. Yeah, that happens to a lot of people. That really does. You know, you write seclusion or just boredom and. Yeah, that working thing's not a bad thing all the time. Well, I think if you like what you do or have done in the past or you're open for something new, right. you know, why not? Or if you're at home all the time and your spouse wants to kill you or something. <laughs> <laughs> and but. is your wife retired also? Well, at the time that I started my mission work, she was not, but now she is. She's a retired fourth grade teacher. Oh, she, oh. she had a very noble she, career, She worked too. for a living then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, tell us a little bit about kind of, I guess, an overview of your work in Africa. And how how you got started in it. You know, I'm often asked the question, how did I get started in uh, mission work? And um, the simplest answer is I was sitting in church one day and a small voice came into my head and said, you know, you've got to do bigger, something bigger than yourself. Uh, you yeah. have the ability to respond and you have the ability and, uh, why don't you get out there and see what's available in mission work? And okay. I kept hearing that voice and I was, um, uh, involved in church management and looked at a website and it had a job for a, a three year assignment for, uh, support services, logistics, uh, in a hospital in Liberia, West Africa. And I answered that particular ad 
And within six weeks, uh, I, my paperwork was being prepared, and uh, I was getting ready to go to Liberia. Wow. Oh, so it happened very quickly once I made the decision to investigate. Evidently, you had the skill set or whatever that they needed. I mean, were they looking for someone in particular, not just a strong back? Or Well... Uh, what I didn't have was a strong back, but what I did have was a lot of work in logistics and supply management okay. and healthcare management, and that's what they wanted. There had been a, uh, a hospital had been run by American administrators for many years, and then the government took it over, and it started to decline. Liberian government, they, right? The Liberian government okay. took it over, and so they uh, wanted to get back to having a if you will, a consultant missionary that was on site. And that's what it started out to be. Okay. And so what was your main job? I saw, I read in the pre-paper that you sent us something about auditing donations and stuff. Well, that wasn't in Liberia. That was in Sierra Leone. Oh, okay. Uh, after Ebola. But when I initially started um, in Liberia, my job was to assist the hospital in managing donations of medical supplies and understanding what their needs were and if indeed our organizations were meeting those needs or if they weren't. And that was uh, the support of the Lutheran Church. Okay. okay. So the Lutheran Church is kind of your umbrella over all this? It was for the first three years. Um but the Lutheran Church, um, first of all, this was self-funded. So okay. the Lutheran Church gave me a little support, but for the most part, it was my money and uh, my resources that okay. I had to use in mission work. Okay. And so what I had to do was to find out who was supporting the hospital and where their support was coming from, and then communicate, open up communication with those groups to say your aid is working or it isn't working and here's where changes need to be made. Oh, okay. Tell us a little bit about what the hospital over there is like cuz I'm I'm in my mind I'm envisioning, you know, American hospital. Right. And even up here where we live, you know, the hospitals here are very very small and very um, you know, few beds, there's not a lot. I can't imagine what I don't have any. I don't have a view in my head about what what does a Liberian hospital look like. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I when I first got there, um, I saw a building that used to be made. It used to be an American hospital. Okay. okay. It was um, uh, built by Americans, equipped by Americans, and run by Americans and had air conditioning and the latest and x-rays and all that type of stuff. But the Civil War, 15 years of Civil War in Liberia caused that hospital to be ransacked and ruined and actually taken to the ground. Oh, my. So, and every piece of infrastructure was removed from the hospital for its metal. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so a hospital in Liberia is not what you would expect. It's a bunch of beds uh, with no mattresses, no sheets, nothing else. Um, the families bring in the foods, and maybe there's one doctor for um, every two or 300 patients. Wow. Um, the people use it as a place for safety. Uh, there's a lot of childbirth, a lot of um, very serious injuries uh, that are war-related. And uh, they're dealing with Band-Aids and uh, whatever they can get because there's not a lot available. Yeah. Yeah. There's no modern equipment. There's no, <clears throat> when you say a drip ID, it's a drip ID. Yeah. It's sort of yeah. like what you see in a war-torn, uh, uh, you know, a war movie where they're like hanging mash. up an ID bag on, yeah. on a tree branch. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's very minimal. Uh, you can't envision it. Um, there's no ambulances. Very, there's a lack of skilled people. There's no equipment. Uh, the biggest piece of equipment they've got is a stethoscope oh my. Uh, and a thermometer. If somebody hadn't stolen it, right? 
Right. Okay, wow. And is the doctor an American missionary, or are they a librarian trained, or are they a real doctor? Or the, the permanent doctors are Liberian or African descent, and they're, they're skilled. Uh, uh-huh. After the war, a lot of the uh, educated people left Liberia and went to the United States and are still here. Um, that's where a lot of the support comes from. Uh, one of the greatest rewards that I had in working as a missionary is finding out how many people in so many different countries will come over on a mission that is specific to, let's just say, um, a specific element and they'll stay for six weeks, bring the supplies with them and do surgery with their team of people and then leave. Okay. Yeah, Kurt's uncle used to do that yeah. to, in Haiti. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there'll be a group of people that come over as a team and build a field hospital, if you will, very quickly, bringing the supplies that they need and will do that particular specialty for a period of time. Okay. All right. So had, had you, before you started doing this in Liberia and, and Sierra Leone, had you ever done any mission work before? No, but during my career, I had gone to um, uh, Saudi Arabia and Singapore and uh, Beirut, and uh, I always worked in healthcare, so I was familiar with uh, different levels of care in third world countries. Uh, I did a lot of mission work with the. When I lived in McAllen, I lived. Uh, I worked with the Mexican Red Cross. Okay. And uh, I did a lot of work across the border in Mexico because Red Cross is sort of like the uh, always available emergency room. Right, right. Okay. And is this like when you went over to Liberia, and I I do want to get to Sierra Leone too, but when you went over to Liberia, was it just you or you with a group of people? No, I was an individual. Uh, I was the only white man on a campus. Wow. Of, um, that was a hundred and some odd acres because the hospital is actually a community of about 10,000 people. Oh my. Okay. And so it's a, it's a big acreage that is owned by the Lutheran church of Liberia. Okay. okay. Yeah. I read that. I read how that, you know, you said it's a safe place and it's a, a gathering spot type of thing. Was there a lot of like bad things happening outside of the campus at the times you were there. Yeah. When you were there. Uh, the majority of the time that I was there, the UN had a presence. Okay. And so they, every time I would ride the 123 miles from the capital city of Monrovia to, um, to, to Phoebe and Bong County, uh, I'd have to go through many checkpoints uh, that are meant to help stem the flow of violence. However, after the war, what were the children's soldiers supposed to do? Oh, and yeah. so there's a lot of violence because it is poor. We're talking about a nation where the average wage is $600 a year, if that. Wow. Uh, people live on about a dollar a day, and uh, it's very difficult. Wow. Yeah, I, I read, you know, I read in your paperwork about how, you know, they're, the only thing they own is their, their water bucket, and that just, that just grips your heart. Well, when you say water bucket, uh, you know, we go down to Home Depot, and uh, we get that five-gallon bucket to haul things around. Uh, we use it for tools and all that type of stuff, and just imagine that, When I first arrived in Liberia, um, I was placed in a home that had been built uh, after World War II by missionaries. And um, World War II, wow. Yeah. yeah. In World War II, because Liberia was a strategic supply point for rubber and iron ore during the world or during the war. Yeah. Biggest biggest company in Liberia was Firestone. Oh, okay. Tires, yeah. I'll be darned. So rubber trees all over the place. Rubber trees are everywhere. Okay. And um, getting back to before you went, I, I keep wanting to jump around here because it's, it's fascinating. 
Um, first of all, how long were you in Liberia for then? And have you been there one time or multiple times? Or I'm still involved from behind the desk with Liberia, but during my active travels, uh, I would go to Liberia twice a year for a period of uh, three to four months up uh, and down to six weeks. And wow. I did that for eight years. Wow. wow. Oh, man. That's impressive, Bruce. Oh, that yeah. That is really, that, that's putting Christianity on a whole nother level. Oh, wow. And I mean, yeah, just the whole logistics of getting ready to spend and to go to a third world like that, you know, I mean, that's a lot of mindset to change too. Cause I mean, you're leaving, you know, the comfort of air conditioning and all of the, the comforts of home and going to, to somewhere that, you know, you don't have any of those kinds of things. Yeah. And before Liberia, I'm sorry, you went to Sierra Le Leone. Well, when Ebola hit, uh, and, and I have to say that the hospital I was at in Liberia, uh, one afternoon we had the first Ebola patient roll into the emergency room. Okay. That immediately caused the international doctors who were there, students mostly from Denmark and uh, European countries, to immediately leave Liberia. Oh, okay. And I was there. I was um, the most informed person about how to do infection control. Oh, okay. And I knew that Ebola was something that I needed to be afraid of, uh, uh -huh. and they did too. And there were no uh, PPEs. Right. Uh, so I had to, and no way of sanitizing. And uh, sadly, the hospital lost seven members of their staff, emergency room staff and ambulance drivers to Ebola. Wow. But, and that was just that hospital. Luckily, I had a contact with um, a hospital in Monrovia called Elwha. Mm -hmm. And if you ever watched anything about, uh, uh, about the Ebola in Africa, you got to know about Elwha because it became the treatment center where the helicopters landed, supplies came in, and all that type of stuff. Okay. And Elwha is ever loving, winning Africa, and it's a Samaritans and Mission Hospital. You know the the Billy Graham organization, oh, and okay. they had a huge complex in Liberia, right on the on the seacoast, that became the hub of all U.S. involvement for Ebola treatment. And it's not far from the airport. And uh, uh, so immediately patients were transferred that 123 miles from, from where I was on the border of Guinea okay. uh, down to Monrovia. Wow. That's just, that's awesome. So yeah, as, a, as a result of that particular trip, because I left, I had to leave. Um, the U.S. Embassy and others were telling people of, uh, to get out of Liberia, and, oh, yeah. and my family was concerned, and yeah. I was as well. So I returned to the United States and continued to support the uh, efforts uh, by sending containers filled with PPEs and, and um, um, sanitizing capsules and that type of thing to Liberia and, and communicating with the doctors uh, almost daily about what the needs were. Huh. But our Senate had supported the Lutheran Church of Sierra Leone for many years, Northern Louisiana, Texas Senate. Okay. And the ambassador for Liberia actually came to Dallas and stayed in our, our camping facility uh, that's here in the Dallas area while Ebola was going on. And what you've got to realize is that Liberians left the country. Wow. The world responded, but Liberian leadership and African leadership left the country. Like the rich Le people or? Anybody that had means okay. left mm -hmm. the country. Wow. Doctors, anyone, yeah. politicians, leadership. Yeah and let the people deal with Ebola on their own, yeah. and then yelled at the United States and other countries for not coming to their aid. Right, right. Wow. 
Ebola is kind of like COVID on steroids, I yeah. think. Yeah, well. Um, in Sierra Leone, I read in your bio that you were auditing donations, that some donations that people would, or churches or senates would give, would just sit there and not be distributed. Is that a, a Com- problem? Yeah, a common thing that happens with missionary well, t- funds. Let me tell you a little bit about Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is different than Liberia. Sierra Leone is a Muslim country. Uh, It's a nation of Islam. Uh, Liberia is a Christian nation. Uh, So I was back here giving a report to the church uh, here in Dallas and to the minister from uh, uh, Sierra Leone about what I had seen in Liberia, and they were telling me that they had similar problems in Sierra Leone. Well, I was getting ready to go back to Liberia, and they said, oh, well, why don't you take a side trip to Sierra Leone and uh, go into Freeport? And I said, well, I can do that. And so I had to get my visa, go into uh, Freeport, and uh, actually stayed on a Lutheran compound that is located in Freeport. Uh, they have a little mission house that hadn't been occupied for a period of time. And they said, what we want you to do is our Senate has been sending a little over a million dollars to this particular Lutheran organization and others. And we want you to see how the funds are being used because every time we go over as a group to with the Lutheran church leadership, uh-huh. we're given a dog and pony show. Yeah. Right. And uh, I am quite familiar with dog and pony shows. Right. Um, Because everything is, uh, you know, people are coming, you know what they're going to look at. You can plan their trip. They're only there for two or three days. Right. What they see and what they don't see. Yeah. So I went as a uh, individual for six weeks to do a surprise audit, if you will, of not only what was being done by the Lutheran church, but also by another group that I was working with called brothers, brothers out of uh, Pittsburgh. Okay. Who had been sending supplies over to support the Ebola efforts of the Christian hospital association of Sierra Leone. And they had an agent and that particular agent was uh, reporting all the good things that the donations were doing. Oh, yeah. And they wanted, they wanted me to check that out. Okay. Okay. And so I went over there with uh, with clean, fresh eyes, if you will, and I was surprised at what I saw, what was wasted, how the money... And he asked a question, is there something you see? The absolute truth is, yes, it happens a lot. Okay. Donations are not used the way they are intended to be used. Okay. So I saw a lot of waste. I saw a lot of greed, Um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the supplies were going to the individuals themselves and not to the people. Uh, The million dollar church that was being built on a hill was um, still being built and they were asking for another million dollars. Oh my. And the donations had come from people just in Dallas, Fort Worth area and Northern Louisiana. And it was difficult to come back and say, you know, folks, what I saw was not a million dollars worth of resources. Right. Right. But at the same time, what I saw was some development of the leadership and the people. And so is that money well spent? I guess it depends on how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the best thing that I saw in Sierra Leone was a, uh, you know, if you, if you read the Bible and you, and uh, you you talk about this thing in the Bible called sand mining. I don't know if you've ever heard about that. No, yeah, no. Yeah. But I went to a sand mining community in Sierra Leone, and what they do is they take out those boats that we see pictured in the Bible. You know, the wooden boats. Right. That are long, and uh, you, you know, you can see Jesus standing on it, right, and right, getting out right. to walk on it, right? Well, here, are, here's a family, and they own a boat, and every morning they go out at low tide, and they 
bring up buckets of sand from the sea bottom, and it's got a lot of shells in it, right. and they bring it up, put it in their boat, and that boat comes back, and they have a pile of sand on the beach. Every family had a pile of sand, hmm. and that was their livelihood. And then the concrete companies come, and they buy this sand and take it because concrete is what that nation is built on. Right. And so I got to see a sand mining community and uh, that was Islamic. Oh, wow. And what was so fascinating was the fact that the uh, Islamic people did not support that community that had been hard hit by Ebola. Oh, okay. The, the Lutheran Church did. Okay. And they built the community, built a Christian church on the premises of this Islamic community. Oh, which wow. had never been unheard of. Yeah. And yeah. we're actually allowing people to go to church and allowed a minister to go go in. And that was a that was a unique situation because I've never seen so much cooperation between the two religions. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It just shows you that it can happen though. It can. That is cool. It can. It can happen, but it takes a lot of work. Oh. And, and and matter of fact, I think I sent you a picture of me standing there with a bunch of the the imams around uh -huh. a well that had been built and uh, um, shaking hands and saying, yes, I'm glad, and I'm going to report back that there was uh, a, a good use of resources. Right, right. That kind of leads me into my next question when you talk about the sand mining. When you were in Liberia for these three months or whatever, what was daily life like? And do you got any good stories, uplifting stories of your life there? Well, in daily life, the, the hospital runs on fuel oil when they have it. So you have a generator that works from dusk to dawn, and it supplies electricity to the entire compound. Okay. So about 90% of the hospital's budget goes to fuel oil. Wow. Um, and as long as you have electricity, then you're fine because you can – you can see at night. Otherwise, you're using candles. Right. And we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But all the people go in at night. There is nobody out on the streets. And one of the things that I brought was um, I, I'd heard of a company called Lucy. Um, okay. And they made solar lights for camping. Oh, okay. Ah, we have one, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and I wrote them. And I said, you know, I'm in missionary work, and uh, can you guys help me out? And they said, well, we'll sell you anything that we have in stock for 50% off. Okay. And we also have a two-for-one special. So if you buy one at 50% off, we'll give you one. Oh, nice. So I got 60 of these lights, and I put them in a suitcase and took them with me. And at the same time, an, a, a company had given me uh, Baylor Scott and White Faith in Action program here in Dallas had given me 600 copies of um, uh, the Good News, which is a paperback Bible of the New Testament. Right. And I was uh, doing some preaching over there in a church as well, and was, uh, acting as a minister. And one Sunday morning, I started. I, I opened up my door. And uh, when I open up my door, I'm blocked with children because they're looking for something to eat. Oh, my. This is every day and yeah. every evening. I was, I was like in a fishbowl because they knew I had resources. Right. And so I've got a screen porch, and the kids come, and they, they scratch on the windows and tell me how hungry they are. And um, then, I, then I walk out my door, and they flock to me. <clears throat> and... Uh, so I opened the door and I took out some of these Bibles and started giving them away with my security guard because I had a full-time security guard because there's a lot of crime at night. Okay. It's not safe to walk at night. Right. Uh, you'll get robbed. And I, and I was indeed robbed three times. Oh, my. So I'm giving these Bibles out and um, I, I was also teaching Sunday school to 600 kids. <laughs> and uh, that wow. meet at the hospital in a, in a in the clinic area that's closed on the weekends. And uh, 
I had all these little paper crosses that were left over from Easter and I'd been giving them out on a number two pencil and a number of other things that they just don't have. Right. And, um, I'd, I'd run a drawing with, uh, with raffle tickets to give away a soccer ball because everybody wants to play oh, football yeah. and, and it's impossible. We're talking about my resources and resources of some people that wanted to support me mm-hmm. and the best use of those. But anyway, I had 600 Bibles. I'm giving them out. And the look on the kids' faces to just get their first book right. that they could call their own. Right. It's just was amazing. amazing. Yeah, yeah. it's just amazing. And you just, it's hard to, you know, you look around where you are and how you live to think that that's still going on in this world. Uh, it's still going on, and uh, it, it, it happens more often than you think, not only in that in that world, but in our world oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'm in, I'm in Texas. I've lived on the border. I've li- uh, my hometown was El Paso. I worked up and down the valley uh, and into Mexico and see the immigrants walking over and uh, the, the hardships that they endure. But they're coming into the United States and every taxpayer, whether we like it or not, involved in, in mission work. Right, right. You know, our taxes pay for a lot of things. And you're right. And, that is kind of a, a mission. You know, I mean, these people, they're coming here for a better life. And I guess if our government can help them, you know, people it's, have their well, opinions. But, yeah, it's 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 just tragic all the way around. Well, I've got mixed opinions about the what, what we're going through right now. But at the same time, I understand the hardships and the reasoning. Uh, there are immigrants in Liberia that come over from other countries because of civil wars. Right, right. So from the Ivory Coast, they try and come into Liberia, but they're coming from poverty into a different level of poverty right. in yeah. hopes of uh, having a little safety. And, uh, you know, early, you, you both are in education, and, and I'm sure that throughout your career you learned about Maslow's hierarchy of right. needs. Correct, right. yes. That was probably one of the most helpful things that I used during my mission work was understanding that until basic needs are met, you can't go up. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. really can't. Uh, yeah, if you don't have you something know, in your, you know, food and shelter, food and you, belly. Yeah. you know, our feeling, our safety, you know, you, you can't even imagine what the other needs are. Yeah, and, and if you're living in fear mm-hmm. right. every day, uh, you're, you're, you're in seclusion. You're, yeah. you're hiding. And uh, you come out only during the daytime. But going back to that Lucy Light before I lose that thought, I I had these kids that would come to my house, and the only light that they had at night was a candle, Mm -hmm. if they could afford it, right? and a match. And I put 60 of these lights out in the sunshine, and I had to watch them because I had to have a security guard there while they charged. (laughs) <laughs> and that night, and one night in my patio, I started giving these little solar lights to these kids. And I said, only one per family. Right. And it's difficult to tell what kid belongs to what family. But at the same time, they all were amazed at the light. Oh, yeah. yeah. And these things would go for all night long. So imagine the fact that I'm now giving them a light that doesn't require monetary um, a means to refill it. Right. It's the gift of God's son. And I use that quite often as, you know, this is a gift from God and God's people. Right. And at the same time, they were given light and they used it to read their book and do their studies at night. And then <laughs> I'd see these little homes that were made out of dirt. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I'd see at night is this light shining through an open door and open windows because there's no windows and no screens. Your heart had to swell. It's pieces of cloth. Yeah, it's amazing. So it's sort of like a teepee out there, and you see all this light coming through. And at night, you can see that light. But light also bought safety because a robber didn't want to go in. There were were light because they were going to be identified. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. That and that was a lot, you know, that was very rewarding for me. Oh, oh I'm yeah, sure. Definitely. I'm sure. What a wonderful way to to spend your retirement. Are you still, you know, like you said, have you gone over lately or are you done going to Africa? 
Uh, the answer is that after the election in Liberia, it became more difficult to go back and less safe. Okay. And I will, this is what happens um, not only in third world countries, but in our own country. But imagine that I had dollar bills initially, and that dollar bill was worth, uh, let's say, 30 Liberian dollars that are not useful anywhere outside of that country. My $1 bill now, I'll get 600 Liberian dollars for. Oh, my. Because that's how much the inflation and poverty has, has, has increased. Wow. And so people can't afford anything. And when the UN left, the safety of the country declined. Oh, that's and sad. so the church and, and during COVID, a lot of international flights were canceled. Um, a lot of uh, people left. Yeah, um, a lot of borders were closed. A lot of borders were closed, including Liberian border. And you have to have a visa to go into the country. They stopped giving visas. So to answer your question, no, I have not been back to Liberia, but I talk to them almost every week. Okay. That's wonderful. And I try and send uh, uh, containers when I can filled with, with items, and we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, it's become very difficult to obtain financing because people quit going to church because of COVID. Right. Congregations are failing, and people are not doing as well as they used to because right. of the many things that COVID caused. So the money has dried up. Yeah, and many many of the uh, social services uh, that were supported by the Lutheran Church and others have stopped because of funding. Yeah, and so funding is very difficult to to uh, obtain and to spend. Uh, I'd say eight thousand dollars to get a container to Liberia. Wow! Uh, after it's filled with supplies. Yeah. Yeah. On a ship that takes six weeks, and, and, and also you have that logistics problem that happened because the Suez Canal was blocked. Yeah, true. So there's a lot of backlog with containers, and it's become very difficult. Yeah. Um, we're go we're going to have to wrap it up here. Do you have any final thoughts before we ask you uh, the last two questions? No, go ahead. Okay. Well, we always end our interviews with the You Betcha moment, which is the best thing that has happened in your retirement. missionary life, Absolutely. retirement. What would your you betcha moment be? Which I'm thinking the little lights, but <laughs> you probably that, have. That's well, lighting my, my heart up, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I learned a lot about myself and my own abilities. And uh, Oh, my gosh, yes. I learned who my true friends are and uh, those that supported my missionary efforts and the many agencies that worked with me to, to that trusted me to use that money wisely and provide aid to people that really needed it, not to a government. Right. right. Um, and I saw that every American, you know, it's really uh, heartwarming to see these, these gifts and vehicles and everything that says a gift to the American people mm -hmm. uh, that are running all around Liberia. So I know the American people efforts are being realized, right. maybe not all the time to the best, but they're being realized. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and your the last thing, the hell no. I guess the worst thing that happened to you, you other said, than being robbed three yeah, times. Yeah. I mean, whoa. Well, <laughs> you can't always believe what you're being told by the host that's going to sponsor you. Okay. And uh, I, if you can imagine, it takes about 24 hours for me to travel from Dallas to where I was, uh -huh. uh, and it's a straight trip. And 123 miles at the time that I arrived on a, if you can imagine, a muddy road that you go 123 miles on and it takes you about eight hours to get there. Yeah. Uh, and then you arrive and you're the only white man that's in on the campus. Uh, <laughs> oh. the, the, the kids have never seen a white man and that's what you're called throughout your missionary white work. Man. But to arrive and have nothing that was supposed to have been prepared for you. So you end up with no water, no toilet, no food, no wow. light, wow. no anything. You're, you're in, in, if you will, seclusion 
in the darkness. Wow. And on my first trip to Liberia, I was given a five-gallon bucket, a plastic bucket that had a handle on it. And my only source of water was to go back and forth to a well uh, to get water to bathe, flush my toilet, and consume. And that water had raw, uh, raw sewage running above it. Oh, man. So without my skills and knowledge of basic sanitation, I would not have made it. Yeah. Well, I think that God put you there for a reason, Bruce, and you did an amazing job. So I'm very proud of you. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was phenomenal. Well, we want to thank you for joining us, Bruce. This has been enlightening. Yeah, I mean, a a total different type of retirement activity, you know, that most people can't even imagine. Yeah. You've settled down now, right? Well, we're, we're, we are, um, we, we went into, uh, travel. We traveled to Europe and to China and, uh, nice. took a few cruises. And then all of a sudden that came to a stop with COVID. Yeah. Right. So I'm settled down, but I'm, I'm facing a health concern. Matter of fact, I'm having some major surgery done next week and that'll redefine how my retirement is defined. Let's okay. put it that way. We wish you the best. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck on that. All right. We're going to let you go. Thanks, Bruce, for joining us. You're welcome. Talk to you later. Well, that wraps up a great interview. Are you crying? I, Man, I want to just, like, donate a million lights. I know. That just, the work that he did in retirement makes so many, I mean, everybody has their own retirement journey. We always say that. But man, he made a difference in a lot of people's lives, and that's just really crazy. I think a lot of retired people do such wonderful work with, you know, with other people and volunteering and doing something like that truly is a passion that you can do when you are retired. Right. And he was saying, after we got off the air... He was saying that uh, he supports still uh, Global Health Ministries in, I think, the Dallas area. So if you look no, that Minneapolis. up. That Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, excuse me. If you look that up and there Global was. Global Health, GHM. Yeah, GHM. So, I mean, if anybody out there wants to help, Bruce isn't directly involved anymore, but there's a lot of people doing a lot of that, good and work. And he supports it that way, too. Yeah, and he supports it. He said it's a great ministry. But so a dollar a day, $500 annual income, that's just you know, in America, we just can't imagine yeah, that. Yeah. Well, thank you. We appreciate you joining us for this amazing talk. Yeah. It, we learned a lot. This is one of those where you you sit back and you just listen. And we you learn get, on wow. every one of them. Yeah. Um, we want to. We appreciate your support. If you uh, keep tuning in to us, if you have a, a an adventure you want to do, something or that, you've already done, right? Something that you've heard about, or that you um, you know somebody that has something like how we found Bruce. Yeah, we're always looking for people, so you can reach us at adventureretired dot com or our email at adventureretired at gmail dot com, or through Facebook, or through Facebook. Facebook. You can page. contact us there, message us there, whatever. We'd love to hear from you, so we can keep hearing these inspiring stories that people have. Yeah. Different- Retirement. A different type of retirement, but uh, what a wonderful one. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. All right. I love you, Cindy. Love you lots of kids and loved you. Yeah, that's a kid who